Hey Optimancers, Chris here. In Appendix A of the Ghosts of Saltmarsh Adventure Book, there is a huge section on running naval campaigns and naval adventures and naval combat. Uh, it's actually incredibly detailed, which is surprising considering it's just an appendix. And what I want to do in today's video is actually run the rules through their paces and see what happens. I am fairly new to these rules myself, so this is going to be a bit of an experiment for me, and I wanted to share it with you. So if you are planning to run a naval campaign or a naval adventure, or maybe you're a player and you're going to be joining a campaign that is a waterborne campaign and you're wondering how to make your character, I think that this video could be a guide for you. Hi, if you like the content you're seeing and you would consider supporting it, please consider doing so through Patreon. A link to my Patreon page is found in the video description. Today I want to thank some of my top level patrons. Airhead, Alexander Baldwin, Alex R, Rob Reichelt, Awesome Face, Barbar, Ben Potts, Benjamin, Bloody Nine, Brett McDowell, Artherazone, CJ, Chris Coons, Christian Windham, Unknown Watcher, Daniel Sturgeon, Dank Train, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David Edgar, David F, David Lotz, David W. Skivens, Dewey Cheatham and Howe, DM Michael 7000, and Douglas Reynolds. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by Alcander's Almanac of All Things. That's an expansion to the 5th edition mechanics by our friend of the channel, The Dungeon Coach. Alcander's Almanac of All Things has a ton of tweaks for the three core pillars of combat, exploration, and social encounters. It's designed to be an expansion of the core rules that we're all familiar with, allowing you to pick and choose which mechanics and rules you want to add to your game. And when it comes to rules expansions, the Dungeon Coach really is the expert in our field. So the idea is you should go through this book, see the things you like, take them, and then just kind of enhance your base game. Chapter 2, this one is the one I'm looking forward to, the Inspiration Overhaul. Uh, Dungeon Coach and I did a couple videos together where we discussed inspiration and how it might be changed to be more interesting and dynamic. And this appears to be the realization of that conversation, so I am looking forward to seeing how that turned out. I will be pinning a comment at the top of this video that is going to have two addresses. One, if you want to pick up the digital PDF, and the other, if you want to do the pre-order for the hardcover. Just be aware that the pre-orders for hardcover are ending on July 31st. This is going to be the only print run of the book, so if you want the hardcover, make sure to check out that link right away. I want to thank the Dungeon Coach for sponsoring this video, and I encourage you all to click those links and take a look. I'm going to try to keep things as simple as I can uh, because I don't think that we want this to be a super long video. I just want to kind of go through the paces and show how it works. So I decided that the ship we would use is a sailing ship. We're going to assume that we're playing in a campaign and I assumed third level characters and we are going to basically run a sailing ship. And according to the rules on the sailing ship, the crew that a sailing ship should have include one captain, four other officers, a first mate, a bosun, a quartermaster, and a cook, and then 25 sailors. And they would suggest that normally a captain would be a bandit captain, normally the other officers would use the nobles stat block, and then the sailors would use the commoners stat block. But since we're doing a campaign and we're playing PCs, I assume that all the officers are going to be PCs, and then the 25 sailors will still be commoners. So here are the statistics for a sailing ship. As you can see, it's a gargantuan vehicle, 100 feet by 20 feet. Creature capacity, 30 crew, plus you could have 20 passengers and 100 tons of cargo. And the travel pace is 5 miles per hour or 120 miles per day. Has a strength of 20, dexterity of 7, constitution of 17. Uh, can't be damaged by poison or psychic damage. That makes sense to me. And then we have some condition immunities. So... Blinded, charmed, deafened, exhaustion, frightened, incapacitated, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, stunned, and unconscious. That seems to be to be most of the conditions, at least. I noticed restrained is missing there. And uh, in last week's video, we actually discussed whirlpools and they can restrain your ship. So that would make sense. Then it shows that on its turn, the ship can take three actions, choosing from the options below. 
can only take two actions if it has fewer than 20 crew and only one action if it has fewer than 10. It can't take these actions if it has fewer than three crew. So what we can see is, although only five of the crew are PCs, losing those commoners that are the regular crew causes the ship to not work as well. And our options are, we could fire Ballista, we could fire Mangonel, we could move, and I should point out that the ship doesn't move in combat unless we use an action to move. So those are our three options each turn. Now the rules say in regards to action, a given action can be chosen only once during a turn. So what that suggests to me then is if we are doing our sailing ship, we have three possible actions and we have three actions we can take on our turn. So I guess we'll do all of them once unless we lose crew and are unable to do so. So I've got a ship here and I have made it 100 feet long and I've made it 20 feet wide and I have put a crew on. Uh, so we have a bossin, a quartermaster, a cook, a first mate, and a captain. And we have a commoner. And what I've done here is you can see the bar, 25 out of 25, the blue bar. That represents how many crew we have. And according to the rules, we shouldn't worry about the exact positioning of these commoners. We should assume they're spread evenly throughout the ship. And what I had to do is I had to make characters for each of the officers. But what I did do is I tried to follow the advice they gave. So they suggest that a captain should have high intelligence and charisma scores. That's not easy to do on a build, to be honest, as well as proficiency with water vehicles and the intimidation and persuasion skills. Says the first mate should have a high charisma score and proficiency in intimidation and persuasion. Says the bossin should have a high strength score and proficiency in carpenter's tools and the athletic skill. And the quartermaster should have a high wisdom score as well as proficiency with navigator's tools and the nature skill. And there's no surgeon on this ship, but there is a cook. And it says a cook should have a high constitution score, as well as proficiency in brewer supplies and cook's utensils. So here's what I came up with. So captain, it says high intelligence and charisma plus intimidation and persuasion. I decided a bard would be the way to go. Did a lore bard. Uh, we've got intelligence. 12 is all I could really get on there. Uh, but I figured that since we can get expertise on skills, probably still okay and then I got a 16 charisma and what I've done is I put expertise in intimidation and persuasion which makes me particularly good at those skills otherwise I just made this a sword spard uh, then next up was the first mate and it says the first mate should have high charisma as well as proficiency with intimidation and persuasion could have made that a bard too but I figured uh, let's go paladin so this is a devotion paladin and I've got proficiency in the required skills. Of course, as a paladin, I won't have expertise. And it says for our next officer, we should have a bossin with a high strength score, as well as proficiency with carpenter's tools and athletics. And so what I've got here is a fighter. And this is a champion fighter. So these are not, as I said, overly optimized characters. But we got a fighter, high strength score, and the required proficiencies. Then the quartermaster is supposed to have a high wisdom score as well as proficiency with navigator's tools and the nature skill. Uh, so I figured, you know, you're going to go either druid or cleric probably. I ended up going druid. I figured stars druid works well for sailing. And again, we have the required proficiencies. And finally, our cook. Uh, and it says our cook should have a high constitution score as well as proficiency with brewer supplies and cook's utensils. So constitution, I figured out, ah, let's go barbarian. So I've got a barbarian here, and again, we have the required skills. As I said, I didn't worry too much about optimizing these characters all that much, but they weren't built badly. They're still all, I think, reasonable characters. Looking again at our sailing ship. So the sailing ship has components, and each of those components has its own armor class and hit points. So we have a hull with an armor class of 15 and 300 hit points with a damage threshold of 15. What the damage threshold means is if the hull takes a single instance of damage of 14 or less, then it does no damage. If it does 15 or more, it does full damage. Uh, and if you lose your hull, well, you're sinking. Next up, we have our control component, which is the helm. This has an armor class of 18, so it's a lot harder to hit, but only 50 hit points and no damage threshold. And it allows you to move up to the speed of the ship's sails with 190 degree turn. If the helm is destroyed, the ship can't turn. So you could really mess up the maneuverability of another ship. The next component is movement, which we have the sails. They have an armor class of only 12, but they have 100 hit points, and you lose 5 feet of speed per 25 damage taken. 
If we use our action to move, we can move 45 feet or 15 feet while sailing into the wind or 60 feet while sailing with the wind. So we need to determine the way that the wind is blowing. And I assumed in this case, we would be sailing with the wind. So the wind is going on this map towards the top of the map. And then we have our two weapons. So the first weapon is the Ballista, armor class 15, hit points 50, plus six to hit for 3d10 piercing damage. And then the second weapon is the Manganel, which is like a catapult, armor class 15, and hit points 100, plus five to hit for 5d10 bludgeoning damage. Thing about the Manganel is it cannot hit targets within 60 feet of it. So you must be 60 feet or more away, or the Manganel cannot make attacks. So what I said I would do for this video is, number one, we're going to run a hazard for this ship, and number two, we're gonna run a combat for this ship. And you can see here I've got my Ballista, and I've put the 50 hit points on there, and there is my Meganel, and it's got 100 hit points. Now, according to what I can see in the rules, direction doesn't matter. So uh, normally you would think with sailing ships, you have to be a certain direction for a certain weapon to attack that direction. At least that's the way it is with cannons, but in this case, you can aim them, I guess, any direction you want to. So I just kind of picked a hazard that we would have to deal with, and I decided, let's have a fire on the ship. So a fire at sea can turn a ship into a burned out hulk, its crew slain, or forced overboard. If a fire erupts aboard a ship, its officers and crew must make a group check to coordinate efforts to extinguish it. The check's DC is randomly determined or chosen from the fire DC's table. The group check represents five minutes of work. The captain, first mate, bossin, and surgeon each make an ability check as shown on the fire check's table. If no one makes the check for a particular officer, a failure is contributed towards the group check. Also, roll a d20 for the crew using its quality score as a modifier to the roll and compare that check to the DC's. Okay, so I see our first issue is that our crew does not have a surgeon. And that means that, according to this, that is treated as an automatic failure. So we have the captain, first mate, and bossin each make an ability check, and the crew make an ability check. And we're going to need three successes out of those four checks. So this is going to be really difficult for us. Uh, so fire DCs, we could have 10, 15, 20, or 25. It also says you could just roll randomly if you wanted to. Now, we're not a high-level party, and in regards to crew quality, they say that a new crew will normally have a plus four quality, so I'm going to assume that's what our crew has, so they have plus four quality. So, we're going to be making four checks, and because it is a group check and the surgeon check is automatically considered a failure, we're going to need three out of four of those to succeed to not burn to death. This kind of makes me wonder if, even if a surgeon isn't recommended for your ship, maybe we would have wanted one anyways. Okay, so let's look at the description for each of these DCs. So it says a DC 10 would be a small contained fire equivalent to an oil lantern. I think that sounds pretty easy, so let's not do that one. DC 15, dangerous flame, equivalent to a large campfire or multiple smaller fires ignited at once. This might be the DC we want to go with. So here's our ship, and we can see that a fire has broken out on the south side of the ship. And the crew starts to work to try to stop it. Let's see what happens. So according to this, the fire checks. The captain needs to make an intelligence water vehicles check. The first mate needs to make a charisma intimidation check. The boss needs to make a strength carpenter's tools check. And the surgeon, it doesn't matter because we don't have a surgeon. All right, so let's get to it. First, we have a captain needs to make an intelligence water vehicles check. Well, our captain has an intelligence of 12. They have proficiency in water vehicles uh, and proficiency bonus at level three is plus two. So that means they're gonna have a plus three on their check. Let's see if they can roll a 15. So I am gonna roll a D20 plus three and I get an 18. The captain has succeeded on their check. So we've got one success. Then it says the first mate is gonna make a charisma intimidation check. So here's our first mate. We've got intimidation here. Uh, I've got beyond 20, which allows me to roll on my roll 20 map. So we'll click that, go back and it should have rolled it. And it did. First mate rolled a 21 on intimidation. So they have also succeeded. Then we have the bossin and they're gonna make a strength carpenter's tools check. 
Uh, so they have proficiency in carpenters tools, that's plus two, and a plus three strength score, so they will have a plus five on their roll. Here we go, 17. So we've made it, all right. And then the crew rolls a natural 20. So I wish I could roll like this in an actual game. So we have 100% success. It says total success. Now we don't actually have total success because we didn't have a surgeon. So I think we just have success. The fire is extinguished, but the hull and 1d3 other random components each take 66 fire damage. Uh, so we would then roll a d3, d3, and we rolled a one. So two components total. And so the hull and one other randomly determined component is gonna take 66 damage. Uh, we have two weapons, we have the sails and we have the control. Uh, so let's let's do in that order. So we're going to do ballista, mangonel, helm, then sails. And I rolled a one, so the ballista. All right, so then I would roll 66 for damage and that damage would be 14. Uh, so my ballista would take 14 points of damage. And the hull would actually take zero points of damage because the 14 doesn't meet the damage threshold. So, okay, so I just rolled incredibly lucky on this entire hazard because I kind of looked at it and I thought we could be in big trouble because we can see here that everyone either had a 50% chance of succeeding or less, which means that we actually, on average, should have failed the checks. And what would have happened? Well, according to this, if we had failed, the hull and D3 other random components would take 66 fire damage and the fire would continue. Then we would make another set of checks. And I should mention that the hull took no damage because I rolled 14. 14 is exceptionally low for 66. You can see here, my totals were one, two, four, one, four, two. So my highest roll was a four and I rolled two ones. Uh, so I got incredibly lucky on that hazard. Uh, but basically what would have happened is if we had failed, then those would take damage and then we would do it again and then potentially take damage again. And let's say I'd rolled completely opposite and we had had total failure. Then the crew's quality score would decrease by one due to injuries as well as the damage to all the components. So I could see it being very easy for a ship to actually sink via fire, very dangerous. Now your DM might allow like the bard to give out inspiration to help people with their checks or something like that. The rules don't really specify whether you can do that or not, but I would assume you probably could if you can expend the resources. So there's the hazard and yeah, we dealt with that no problem. Uh, so we finished off the hazard and now we've encountered another ship. Now Appendix A has a massive quantity of information on how to determine randomly what kind of ships you might face, what their attitudes are going to be, who's going to be on board, what the purpose of the ship is, what they might be dealing with at the time, all kinds of things. But what I want to do is I want to test the combat rules. So what I've done is I've set up another ship that is also a sailing ship and I've just used exactly the stat blocks that they recommend. So we have basically an identical ship. The captain of the ship is a bandit captain. The first mate, quartermaster, cook, and bossin are all the noble stat block. And then we have our 25 crew. So this is basically the same as the ship I have, except instead of PCs, we have the standard stat blocks. So I'm gonna assume these ships have come up next to each other like this and maybe they've shouted some insults or threats across and combat has broken out. All right, so let's go through this. First, we need to roll initiative and the ships each roll initiative as well. The ship's initiative is equal to its dexterity modifier plus the crew quality. So our crew quality we said was four. We're gonna say that the opponent's crew quality is also four, we'll make this an even fight. So that is going to give each ship a plus two initiative modifier. So we're going to bring up initiative here. And first and foremost, we're going to roll for our own ship for initiative. And we roll a 16. And then we're going to roll for the enemy ship for initiative. And it rolls a nine. So we have one initiative. But we also need to roll for everyone else on board, or at least the officers. So according to this, the first one to act is the captain. 
Now I have two options. The captain could take an action as normal. So he's a bard. He could give out inspiration. He could cast a spell. Uh, he could fire a weapon. The other thing he could do is one of the special actions. So according to this, there are special officer actions. During the encounter, the captain, first mate, and bossin each have access to two special action options. Take aim and full speed ahead, both detailed below. So first off, take aim as an action. The captain, first mate, or bossin directs the crew's firing, aiding, and aiming one of the ship's weapons. Select one of the ship's weapons that is within 10 feet of the officer. It gains advantage on the next attack roll it makes before the end of the ship's next turn or full speed ahead as an action while on deck. The captain, first mate, or bossin can get the ship to move forward faster. We roll a d6 and multiply the result by 5. Apply the total as a bonus to the ship's speed until the end of the ship's next turn. If the ship is already benefiting from this action's bonus, don't add the bonuses together. The highest bonus applies. So I think I'd like to take one of these special actions. Why not? So the captain is going to move uh, 5, 10, 15, 20... 25 and they're going to give advantage to the Meganel. Then the Boston can take a turn and I think they'll do the special action as well. So they'll give advantage to the Ballista. And now our ship gets to take its turn. So we can take three actions on our turn and those actions are going to have to be firing the Ballista, firing the Meganel, and moving. Uh, so let's start by firing our weapons. I think We'll start by checking out what the range is on our weapons. So it looks like we're just under 100 feet away from the other ship. So according to this, we're within short range, but we are not beneath the minimum range of the Meganel. And I think what we might want to do here, I'm thinking about strategy, I think we might want to hit the sails. Because if we can hit the sails of the other ship, then we can control the range. And when we have something like a Meganel that you have to be a certain distance away for it to even fire, and also the difference between short and long range could potentially be something that we could take advantage of, I think that's what we want to do. So I think we will fire our Ballista and Meganel at the opposing ship's sails. Uh, the opposing ship's sails have an armor class of 12, and they have hit points of 100, but they lose 5 feet of speed per 25 damage taken. And according to this, I've got a 25 and a 22, both easy hits. Uh, so let's go ahead and roll some damage. So we hit with the Ballista, and we hit with the Meganel, and this is all going to the enemy's sails. Uh, so it looks like we have 22 plus 32, that is 54 points of damage. The sails have 100 hit points. So I'm going to just keep track of that up there. So they now have 48 hit points left. Uh, and if we look here, it looks like they've lost 10 feet of movement. Uh, so they can now move 35 feet or 5 feet while sailing into the wind or 50 feet while sailing with the wind. And then we're going to take our movement. And I think what I would want to do here is I would want to move above the other ship. Um, and that way, remember the wind is pointing upwards. So what I think we should do is we should maybe move our ship. Uh, now we can move up to uh, 60 feet with the wind. So we're kind of moving with the wind here. So it looks like we could move that far. Uh, so yeah, let's close the distance. Also, I bet we could beat these guys if we ended up boarding. Now their first mate is going to go. Uh, so he'll take a special action as he's right at the ballista. So why doesn't he do his take aim option? Now it's our cook's turn. So the cook doesn't have any special options, so let's see what their regular options include. So they have a light crossbow, attacks at plus 4 for a d8 plus 2 to hit. Or they could throw a javelin, but I think we would be in long range for the javelin. But I think we should be in short range for the light crossbow. It has a range of 80, and I believe we've closed below that. So they will fire their light crossbow, and you know what? Might as well keep targeting the sails. And it says the crossbow had a 16 to hit for 10 points of damage. So yeah, we have damaged the sails again. Not enough to slow them anymore, but we're getting closer. They're at 38 hit points on those sails. Next up is our first mate. But looking at spells here, we have Bless Command, Protection from Evil and Good, Sanctuary, Shield of Faith, and Wrathful Smite. Now I'm curious if we're in range for the command spell. So it is a 60 foot range. So looking at the map here, it looks like if we move right to the edge, uh, so this is supposed to be a 20 foot wide vessel, so we should be able to move there. Then the bandit captain is within 60 feet of us. So we will cast command. 
then the enemy captain is going to have to make a saving throw. Uh, so it's a DC 13 wisdom saving throw. So let's see if they make that save. They have rolled a 5, so they have failed on the command. So you speak a one word command to a creature you can see within range. The target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw, which he failed, or follow the command on its next turn. Approach or flee, then the captain is going to move either towards me or away from me as fast as it can and end up in the water. So I think that's a great way to go. Uh, so I'll tell the bandit captain to flee. Then I'll use the rest of my turn and move back more towards the center of the ship. Then comes the cook. So this is the enemy cook and they use the noble stat block. Uh, so they have a rapier attack. That's not going to do them any good and they really don't have much else they can do. And the cook has no special actions, so they're not going to be able to do anything. Then our bandit captain. Well, they failed their saving throw, so they're going to move away from me from the fastest means possible. They have a movement speed of 30. So there's 5, there's 10, they're in the water. Now they're swimming. Uh, so that'd be 15, 20, and 25, 30. That's as far away as they could get. Now comes the enemy ship. All right, so I'm looking at the rules for actions here. It says this part of the stat block specifies what the ship can do on its turn using special actions rather than the actions used by creatures. It even relies on its actions to move. It doesn't have a move otherwise. The ship's captain decides which actions to use. A given action can only be chosen once in a turn. Now, the captain has jumped off the enemy ship, but you know what? Technically speaking, I can't see why they couldn't still give orders. So I'm going to assume this ship can still take its actions. So it's going to fire its weapons. And the movement of our ship has not prevented them from attacking because we can see the Mangadel here can fire more than 60 feet and still hit our ship. Pretty much anything it wants on our ship. So yeah, they don't even need to move. They'll be able to attack everything at short range. So I think what they're going to do is try to remove our ability to attack them. So they're going to attack our Ballista. It has an armor class of 15 and 50 hit points. And I'm seeing that the Ballista has missed, but the Mangonel has gotten a critical hit. Uh, and boy, that is going to be pretty nasty because it does 5d10. That'll double the 10d10 damage to our Ballista. So we'll roll the damage. And I am seeing 63 points of total damage. And yeah. Our ballista is now gone. In terms of movement, so they'll move a little bit over forward and to the right and make it easier for the captain to get back on the ship. All right, now it's the quartermaster's turn on the enemy ship. So they see the captain is in the water. Uh, so I imagine they would probably grab a rope and head over there and lower it down to the captain so he can climb back up on his next turn. Now it's our bossin. So our bossin could take a special action or they could take an action of their own. I, I think they'll take an action of their own. This is our champion fighter, and we can see they have a heavy crossbow, does a d10 plus three damage. And uh, with the sails of the enemy ship becoming more and more damaged, uh, I think we should concentrate on those. So they will fire their heavy crossbows at the enemy sails, armor class 12. And we've got an 18 to hit for seven damage. So a hit, but not great damage, that's okay. Uh, so we will reduce from 38 to 31. And what the heck, we'll even do an action surge and attack again. 23 to hit for 8 more damage. This lowers their sails to 23 hit points. They have now taken over 75 points, which means they have a minus 15 feet movement speed, so they cannot sail into the wind anymore, but with regular movement they can only move 30 feet. But if we can just do that additional 23 damage, they won't be able to move at all. Next up is our Quartermaster. Our Quartermaster is a Druid. Let's see what spells they have. Now Moonbeam is an area of effect spell. And it says, Crew casualties. In the case of spells that cover an area, such as Fireball or Lightning Bolt, you might track the exact location of the spell and crew to determine how many sailors it affects. Alternatively, you can roll a d6 per level of the spell. The total dice is the number of crew members caught in the spell's area. Let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to cast Moonbeam. We're going to hit 2d6 crew with it. So let's go ahead and roll the 2d6. Both sixes. Uh, so we have hit 12 crew with the Moonbeam. Now let's roll damage. Three points of damage. So we have killed nobody. <laughs> we have 12 crew members, very, very injured. But because of a bad roll, we have killed zero crew. We're back up to the top, 
and it's our captain's turn again. Uh, so he'll cast Shatter on enemy ship. Yep, 15 points of damage, doesn't matter if they make their save or not. So now we need to roll 2d6 to see how many crew casualties are taken. And we got a 4 and a 6, so 10 of the enemy crew are dead. So here where we have commoners, we had 25 crew, and they have lost 10 of them. They now have 15 crew left. And if we look, on a turn, a ship can take three actions, choosing from the options below. It can only take two actions if it has fewer than 20 crew, and only one action if it has fewer than 10. Well, they have five officers and 15 commoners. That's 20 crew, so that is just enough to still take the three actions. But if one more crew member dies, they'll only have two actions on their turn. Enemy Boston's turn. Uh, I think they'll take the special action to take aim with the mangonel. And then it's our ship's turn again. Okay, so first thing to note, we no longer have a ballista. But those enemy sails are looking rough. Now, we didn't take aim this turn, but I think we will attack the sails with our mangonel. And we rolled terrible. We rolled an 11, and I guess we should have taken aim. So our mangonel has missed, so our ship has not successfully attacked this ship. Uh, but we can take our movement action. So we'll continue to sail with the wind. We can turn up to 90 degrees as part of our movement. So let's go ahead and go like this way. Now I'm trying to see where I could move to get within range of their Maganel. I mean, I think you have to move forward with your ship. You can turn 90 degrees, but essentially you kind of need to move forward. In fact, on my last turn, I think I slipped sideways. And I don't think you can do that. I think I should have actually turned the ship a bit. And yeah, I don't think I can get within range of their Maganel unless I like literally crash into their ship. And I don't think I want to crash ships at this point. So I think our ship is going to do a turn to maybe about there. All right, their first mate is going to take aim with the ballista. Now it's time for a cook. So I think she'll just be boring and fire at their sails. So she fires, oh, she hits and does nine points of damage. Those enemy sails are looking rough. They're down to 14 hit points. Next up is our first mate. And our first mate is going to go back to the mangonel. Oh, we can get how far? We can get there. That is, uh, that is within 10 feet of the mangonel, so they can take their special action to take aim. Uh, because we should have done that last time, apparently. Enemy cook can't do much. Bandit captain can climb back into the ship, so it's going to climb up the rope. Um, and that's going to use probably most of its movement, I would think. But he does have a ranged attack, which has a 60-foot range. And pretty much attack uh, any of these crew members that are closer. Uh, so let's have him attack the quartermaster. Uh, this will be a disadvantage attack because he is at long range with his thrown dagger. That's a 13 to hit. And our quartermaster has a 16 armor class, so they're fine. Now the enemy ship, and their Meganel is still just fine, so they will be able to fire both weapons. I think it occurs to them that if they attack our Meganel and destroy it, we will be without a weapon. So that's what they're going to do, they're going to concentrate on our weapon. Uh, and I do believe that both their weapons now have advantage. We've got a 22 to hit with the Ballista, and a 16 to hit with the Meganel, so those are both hits on our Meganel. So we'll apply that. 29 damage total. Um, I don't think they want to move, because if they move forward, that, that Meganel is actually closer to our ship, uh, and they don't want that. Uh, their quartermaster uh, has rescued the captain, so now he's going to head up here. So I think he'll head to the ships and do the full speed ahead special action. So that will be a D6 times 5, and that is added as a bonus to the ship's speed until the end of the ship's next turn. Uh, so then maybe they could blow right past us. Besides, nobody's taking this action yet, and I want to see what it does. All right, so we got three, so they're going to add 15 feet to their movement, which is exactly the amount of movement speed they've lost from damaged sails. Next up is our boss, and that's our fighter, and he definitely wants to make a shot at those sails, so let's do it. That's a hit of the enemy sails for 10 points of damage. Next up is our quartermaster. And I think they're going to do another moonbeam. So they'll cast moonbeam again. Uh, hopefully they roll better than they did last time for damage. 
11 points of damage. All right, so that is way better. So we're going to roll 2d6 to see how many crew members it hits, and they will automatically die, because even if they save, that's enough to kill them anyway. So we hit five more crew. So they're down to 10 crew, and that means that they can only take two actions on their ship's turn. And now our captain gets to go. And I'm liking this, so let's do another shatter spell as well. This one rolled poorly, uh, but four might be enough to kill crew members. Look at that roll, 2 one, one on 3d8. But let's see how many crew members we hit with it. We have also hit five crew members. So five DC 13 constitution saving throws. One, two, three, four, five and it looks like two of them succeeded, so we have killed three more crew members. The enemy bossin is going to aim with their Meganel, and now our ship gets a turn. So I think at this point, uh, we have pretty much destroyed their sails. Not quite, but the Meganel on the sails almost seems like overkill. Uh, so I think what we wanna do actually is maybe go after their Meganel. If we can get rid of that and control the range, then I think we can beat them. So let's go ahead and attack with the Meganel. And we missed. All right, so, so much for that. Their first mate will take the special aim action on their ballista. Our cook is going to attempt to finish off their sails. So their sails have four more hit points, uh, so they'll fire their light crossbow, and that'll hit, and that is the end of their sails. So now their, their sail component is destroyed, their ship cannot move. Next comes our first mate. They have a javelin they could throw, so let's see how close they can get. Uh, so if they move 30 feet to, say, here, then that is 45 feet, so that would be with disadvantage. We don't want to be attacking with disadvantage, I don't think. Uh, so I think the first mate will take the dash action. And they'll dash up to there, and then next turn, maybe, they can leap across. All right, so their cook, again, can't do very much. Their bandit captain, uh, well, they've already got their both their weapons, I think, have taken the special aim, and they only have two actions to do on their turn, so there's no point him taking a special action. But he is significantly tougher than the rest of his crew, and he probably sees that we're starting to get, looking like we're gonna cross, so he might just move into position and dodge. Then comes their turn. They're going to continue to target our Meganel. They both have advantage, so Ballista, Ballista, Meganel, Meganel. And we're looking for armor class 15. And they have both hit. Gonna be 45 points. Our Meganel is looking bad. Their quartermaster can't do much. Now it's our boss's turn. All right, so what I'm seeing here is our Meganel is gonna get destroyed before theirs for sure, but their sails are destroyed. So what we could do here is we could just get away. Uh, so basically we could do full speed ahead uh, and then we could sail with the wind and they just wouldn't be able to catch us. However, I want to finish these guys off. Uh, so if we're not going to be able to do weapons, then we're going to do it man to man. So our bossin is taking out their great axe and I think we're going to run across. That would be five, 10, and then a jump, 15, 20, 25. And they've landed there. Uh, now the captain is dodging, so let's go down to here with 30 feet, and we will attack the first mate. Now it's our captain, and our captain is going to attempt to finish him off. Rape your attack. Advantage because of the guiding bolt. That hits eight points of damage. He'll do a second blade flourish. Again, a defensive flourish. For three more, and that is enough. And the enemy ship has not only been defeated, it's been taken. And it's got potentially some nice replacements for our weapons that are very damaged. So we might even want to see about moving their ballista and their Meganel onto our ship. Uh, and then sailing away at 100%. So that's ship combat in D&D. So that's how it works. Last half of this video was just a regular combat, but uh, you can kind of see how as the combat progresses, uh, if those ships get close enough together, 
then what's going to happen is you're going to have standard combat. But there was also the possibility of running away. Uh, we had that option. Now I targeted the sails. I don't know if that was the best move or not. They targeted weapons, and I don't know if that was the best move or not. I think it would require doing this a lot of times before I figured out what all the best moves were. But that is naval combat and naval hazards in D&D actually played out. Hope you enjoyed it. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thank you.